that's working. I'm just going to share um, my screen. Um, the first thing I really wanted to say was thank you to you all. Um, it's been a long, it's been a long ride with this track, which was originally in the diary for three years ago. And I know some of you signed up way before then as well. So, um, yeah, we're really grateful for you to, for all the support you've um, given War Trade and for trusting that um, at some point we'd be a, a place in the world where we can do these kind of events again um, and travel um, more freely than we could um, when we were originally due to do the event. Um, so I'm just going to do, yeah, so for me, this is a, um, I know someone said this was a highlight of their week, but for me, this is one of the highlights of the year, really, that we can go ahead with this. It's been a long time coming. So thank you um, and good to see you all. Um, so I'm sure you all know what's going to happen on the track because um, you've probably been anticipating it for for a long, long time, but um, Rob is going to take you through the details of what will happen on the track. Um, and I'm just going to give you a bit of an overview of the war trade side. Um, it's a bit different to some of the other years that we've done. Um, so the reason we're all here, obviously we um, are really excited for an adventure, but um, the motivation behind um, doing a track for war trade is to help us with our work to reach people with clean water, decent toilets and good hygiene, which over the years of the pandemic has become even more prominent in people's minds. And actually the support we got during the pandemic um, for the cause from people that had never thought really about access to hand washing and hygiene in the past, um, it was coming at front of everyone's mind and the link with washing hands and diseases. So, um, it's as important as ever um, that war trade exists um, and people like you um, raise awareness and funds for us. So this is just a bit of a reminder of what you're going to be experiencing. Showing myself up with my PowerPoint skills. Hopefully it will move on for me in a second. got stuck. All right, so let me try again. Sorry, guys. my laptop has crashed which isn't ideal um <laughs> do you want me to do my bit what's going on it looks like helen's frozen yeah <laughs> this is still it is still yeah, recording a hydrave area Hey. Oh, can you hear me? We oh, can. Sorry. I'm just chatting right. away in the background. Sorry, guys. Oh, sorry. We, I, no, we can only hear you now. It's all right. I, I saw you You flash up. Uh, Helen was just starting to go through a PowerPoint and I, she was saying sorry. she was having technical issues. So I think I was having a lot of Teams issues. Apologies. Yeah, it seems to be getting particularly bad. I don't. Teams seems to have been really flaky recently. Mm. I think maybe, uh, Rob, you could maybe start. I will. Why not? Um, hopefully <laughs> Helen will get her laptop sorted. I mean, you know, oh, she's back. Um, hopefully this will work. What's well, a good start? 
Can you see that? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Moving on. So, um, as part of the track, um, obviously, um, we want you to have as much of a um, a great experience of um, the Nepalese culture. So, Rob's going to talk to you um, about an opportunity that's come up. Um, to visit and stay in a village in a homestay. Originally on the trek, you were going to be camping. Um, so this is a really exciting opportunity to experience the culture um, and meet um, some um, Nepalese people. So on previous War Trade tracks, um, we've had a War Trade UK rep on the trek. Um, but this year, um, in response to COVID, we're actually, um, as a war trade team, we're reducing our travel um, and we're trying to do a lot more virtually. Um, and in light of the pandemic, as you know, costs of travel have gone up a lot. So we won't actually be attending the track. Um, but we, um, you will be in the safe hands of um, Discover Adventure. Um, and Steve, who led the track in Tanzania for us, is going to be leading um, the track um, in Nepal and he's a really experienced mountaineer so um, he'll be a great person to be leading the track um, in Nepal with you. Um, we're also um, looking into the opportunity for you to meet with Manny who is our communications manager in Nepal um, and he visits a lot of projects um, like the villages that you funded through your work um, and he'll be able to give you a real flavour of the impact that the fundraising you've done has made um, on communities in Nepal. Um, you also get um, to experience Tiha, which is um, one of the festivals that takes place in Nepal. Um, so when you visit um, this village, you'll be able to um, interact and understand some of the customs that um, take place as part of the um, festival as well. So it's going to be a great time for you to be there. Is this still recording? Do we know? Yes, it is still recording. Um, so I already mentioned it before that um, we've done a lot of work um, to adapt our programmes um, in Nepal and other countries um, all around the globe um, since the pandemic. Um, for example, um, in Kathmandu, some water points um, that were contact free um, were put in um, to the city um, in order to help with hand washing and hygiene. Um, and we've we've done a lot of this adaptation work um, through the pandemic. Now the pandemic is kind of um, impacting things less. Um, our teams on the ground are really, really busy um, trying to keep up with all of the work that couldn't happen um, during the pandemic. Um, so our programmes team are um, flat out at the moment with um, making that work happen. Um, so like I say, you'll get an opportunity um, to meet with Manny um, and we're also actually looking um, into the opportunity um, to meet with Manny in the UK as well. He's actually uh, planning to visit the UK in November. Um, so we're looking into the option for you to meet up with him um, or do a webinar or Q&A with him um, in November after the trip. Um, and he'll be able to provide you with updates um, on the project that you funded um, while you're in country as well. Um, I'm not going to try and play another video because that might well go wrong. Um, the project that you've been raising funds for um, is called the Foundations for Future Project, um, and it's in the Dalaka district of Nepal. Um, I'm just going to share with you a little bit of the progress that's already been made on this project over the last few years. Um, so the aim of the project is to reach 6,000 people with clean water, build toilets and hand washing facilities and lobby local governments. Um, and so far, um, we've reached 74% of the goal um, of reaching people with clean water. Um, we've exceeded the target for um, providing sanitation. Um, and we're about halfway there with um, our hygiene education in that community. Manny's visited this community quite a few times, which is a remote community. Um, and quite difficult to get to, and he'll be able to update you more on um, the progress of that project as well. So now I'm going to hand over to Rob. Um, uh, good luck with the tech, hopefully it all works. 
Yes, well, thank you. I will, yeah. The only way is up. Is that not what they say? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you've, you've set a nice base level for me to try and do it. So I'm going to share my screen and hopefully everybody can see the presentation. Yep. A thumbs up if you can. Yes, fantastic. Okay. Um, yes, thanks, Helen. Um, as said, my name is Rob from Discover Adventure. We are in charge of the logistics behind the trips. If you've done trips with WaterAid before, then um, as Helen said, you will know how we operate. And yeah, very fortunate to have Steve um, guiding you again on this if you were on the Tanzania trip and have, have met him. As Helen said, he's a very experienced guide. He's an international mountain guide, um, been working for us for a long, long time, travels all over the world, lots of different groups. Um, he also used to be head of cabin services for BA um, for 20-odd for years, so his customer service is fantastic as well. Um, and he will, you know, he'll really look after you. Um, and he will also um, play you know, part of the role for WaterAid to ensure that, you know, he's sharing those messages about the importance of the fundraising that you're doing and, you know, the reasons why you're, you're there and help you through some of the tougher moments of the trek um, and just remind us, you know, what we're, we're all there for a sort of common purpose. So, you know, he will, he'll play that role as well, um, supported by uh, Palmer, who's the, who's the doctor. And I'll come on to that in a little bit. Let me, oh, near me, here we go. So, Discover Adventure, we have been going since 1994, um, started as a little mountain bike company, got into charity market in 97, and have been doing that pretty, pretty much solely for the last 25 years. I am the general manager. I've been here 20 years. In fact, I just celebrated my 20th, 20th anniversary last week, um, and I... I have a background as a mountain guide myself so i've led lots of trips um and just got more and more involved in in the company as we went we have uh, uh helped to i think we work with about two and a half thousand uh different uk charities raising lots of money you know on trips similar to this um and we have a real sort of prioritized the, the safety of um, the participants, which is why lots of charities that uh, choose to work with us, send in, you know, with qualified and experienced guides like Steve, as well as being supported by a UK doctor in Palmer, plus then the local teams that we support. We're a very family feel uh, company. It was started by Jonathan, who still is the managing director, runs and owns the company, still very hands on. His wife, Jane, is our company GP. Um, and we extend that out to all of our local uh, teams in, in the countries that we work with. So um, hopefully you will, if you have already been on one of our trips, you'll experience that again. Um, and if not, you will get to experience it for the first time. So yeah, looking after you, that's our main role. You're doing all the hard work with the fundraising. When you get there, it's about enjoying yourself. Um, yes, it's challenging. And that's why um, you've to put all the effort into fundraising, but we want you to enjoy the experience, get as much out of it as possible. And, but to do that, you want to feel safe and that's why we do that. And we've got a, a UK team um, that supports you um, should, should there be a need. Hopefully we just get lots of nice photos sent to us um, along the way to say you're having a great time and then you know talk to somebody at the end of the trip when you get back um, to say how wonderful it was, but should the need arise, we have a, a 24 hour backup system in the UK um, linked with, with the charity as well that we can we put into practice. Um, we are based in Wiltshire, um, down just now near Salisbury, became obviously very famous for Novichok and Russian tourists, which we've never seen before, but there are plenty of them apparently. Um, and yeah, on the trip itself, you'll be supported by Steve and Palmer's the doctor, plus some you know, lot local guides and assistants and uh, a support network. Um, so the, the trek itself is 10 days UK to UK. Um, 
the the great thing about um, this trek is you go into the sort of foothills of the Himalayas. So in terms of altitude, it's not too bad. Yes, we do go above two and a half thousand meters, which is kind of the official start of suffering from altitude sickness. But because you are ascending and walking slowly above that point and you're not actually above two and a half thousand meters for very long, um, it would be very rare for people to, to suffer from altitude sickness. So you're in the foothills, um, and if you get nice clear days, then you do get fantastic views like, like this of, of the Annapurna range, um, which is just absolutely spectacular and a real highlight of the trip. As we were, as, Anne, as, as Helen was saying, the, uh, the, the cultural side of this trip is, is quite different to other, other trips. Some, you know, where we walk in national parks um, and it's, it's mostly about the, the walking and maybe coming across the occasional village, but other than that, um, spending time out in the natural environment. This one is out in the foothills and natural environment, but still very much in and amongst villages, cultivated land. So you're really immersed in that culture, you know, um, gives you a real sort of glimpse into what the life of Himalayan uh, culture is. Also going through where um, a region where the Gurkhas originate, so the sort of the Gurkhas who are became part of the uh, British army fighting force, they originate from this area of Nepal. Um, and so you get those yeah, beautiful mountain views. The things that make the, 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 the trip challenging, I suppose, um, are the, the continuously undulating terrain. It is very little flat on it. You're, you know, it's uh, as the, the hills rise towards the mountains, you've got quite steep sided valleys that you are going up and down and cutting through and crossing. Um, and so that's constantly up and down um, adds that sort of challenge terrain. Um, also, as Helen was saying, because we're a, a smaller team and you haven't got that opportunity to have the sort of dedicated day of going to see the, a water aid project, we've been sort of looking at ways to just to increase that cultural immersion on the trip itself, just so that you can really get a, a good idea of, of how the locals live their lives. Um, and so by tweaking the itinerary very slightly, we're going to hopefully be able to um, stay in homestays each of the nights. You're still doing the same trekking routes. There's one night where we were going to be camping up on the top of Tara Top. Now there isn't any homestays up there. So in order to achieve a homestay style um, trek, we would need to go up to Tara Top, have lunch and watch, you know, hopefully get the views that you would get from the top and then continue on for another couple of hours down into the valley and have a have a night there. And as Helen said, that's a, a town called Sickless, um, which is one of the main towns of the region, um, a real heart, heartland of where the Gurkhas come from. And so actually having an opportunity to stay there um, and immerse ourselves in that culture, especially given it's on you know, a festival day is you know, a really great opportunity. Previously, with a camping itinerary, you would have stayed in another village and gone to visit Sicklers just for an hour or two. So this really gives us an opportunity to uh, to change that a little bit. It hasn't changed the, the route um, particularly. It has made one day a bit longer, but that's great because it just adds that sort of challenge and you probably then, you know, badger your supporters for some extra um, sponsorship having done a, a particularly tough day um, and it also gives a, a day um, to explore and immerse ourselves in that sort of cultural side of Cyclus and the, and the surrounding area. Um, so where in the world or where within Nepal are we? So on the left hand side there this is sort of general map of Nepal. Kathmandu sits uh, not quite bang in the middle of it slightly over to the right and obviously our international flights fly into there and then over towards the west, you've got Pokhara, which um, is the main town of the, the region that we're flying into. And directly north of there, you can see Annapurna. Um, and then on the right hand side, a slightly more zoomed in map of 
of Pokhara. Um, so you've got the Annapurnas here, and they call them the Annapurnas because there's actually four mountains with the name Annapurna. Um, and very, with you know, with great imagination, they're called Annapurna 1, Annapurna 2, Annapurna 3, Annapurna 4. Um, only Annapurna 1 is over 8,000 metres. Um, but the whole range, it sort of arcs across in front of you and is, is really stunning to see. So there they're sort of in the distance. And so between Pokhara there at the bottom and these big mountains high up on the, the tops, um, you have this sort of middle ground that we were talking about, you know, the sort of foothills. Um, Cyclus is just over here. Um, and our trek essentially comes out of Pokhara, a bit of a um, transfer out into this valley. And then you trek up and around here. Tara Top is somewhere. In, could you see my arrow moving around? Yeah. 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 Excellent. That's good. I thought just for a minute, I thought, well, what happens if they can't see my arrow? Um, so yeah, Tara Top, our high point is about 2,800 meters. It's up here and then down to Cyclas. Um, and before we then continue on and get picked up somewhere around here at the end of the trek to come back to Pokhara. So that's sort of gives you puts everything into a bit of perspective there's nepal Kathmandu, a morning flight to pokhara and then we're in these foothills jammed between pokhara and the high mountains of the himalayas um oh there you go zoomed in even a little bit more so there's a trekking map here so pokhara down in the bottom and our trekking region is within this sort of turquoise circle so we come into this valley here um, names that you'll see on your itinerary, Galagion is here um, in this region, and then we follow and come up this ridge, and we've got Tara Top up here, and then down to Cyclas. So what we would previously would have done would be to stay up here, and then the next day be a shorter day down to Cyclas, have a look around and down to Parche or maybe there's another path actually that comes down through here direct to Parche or comes across this ridge line into Parche and we would have camped there and then gone to Cyclas to um, just to explore for a couple of hours but as I said we will do from Gallagher on up to Tara Top and down to Cyclas in one day so that's going to be you know, has now become the sort of big day. It's totally achievable, I would have thought, somewhere between eight and nine hours in total um, for that day now. And it allows us to then stay in Cyclas um, and you will go the next day, there will be a, a circular walk or an up and there to explore this part of the valley, which we wouldn't have had time to do um, previously on, on an itinerary. So you get a chance to go a bit further north, a bit further, more remote up away from the, the sort of the valley down here towards the, the high mountains um, and then back to Cyclas for a second night. And then the trek continues down to the um, river here, cross and then come along. This is ascending up along the hillside to Tanting, which is our sort of final night of, of staying there. Um, and then the last day, down from Tanting, cross the river again. And this, this is a big river. It doesn't look much on the, this map, but it's a big river. Um, and we get picked up somewhere around here um, and transfer to Pokhara. So that's the sort of trekking region that we're going to be working within. Um, typical days. Um, and like I said, they will vary if some days are a bit longer. But typical days, getting up at 6.30, having some breakfast. Um, packing our bags and hopefully have our bags packed um, by breakfast so that the, the, the porters and the team can, can get everything loaded up and start moving to um, get themselves in position for the next location. Um, have a briefing, do some warm ups and stretches and then set off around eight o'clock. We try and break the day up into four main sections now see nobody's moved in my office well there's nobody else in my office which is why all the lights have automatically gone off and i might have gone into the dark if you can see my um see my picture but yeah break the day up into four main sections a mid-morning break a lunch break and a mid-afternoon and those points that we're trying to you know make sure i mean you're a nice small team anyway of 12 people so you know we'd hope that we can keep everyone pretty much together throughout but those are sort of definite points where we'll do regroups um 
and that you know if there are interim ones at the top of the pass or people need to you know readjust and have a, a five minute break then obviously those those little mini breaks can happen as well but that's generally how we split the day up um and then getting into camp anywhere between um sort of four five possibly six on that longer day um have time to get ourselves sorted out and then have dinner around seven o'clock and a briefing and that's generally how the days go like i said in that briefing steve might say actually guys it's an easier day tomorrow um we'll slide everything by half an hour or we need to go half an hour early or the forecast is that it's going to be you know raining hopefully not but you know the forecast is that it's going to stop so let's leave it a bit and uh, try and aim to leave you know so there will be really important that you get that evening briefing from steve and the team just to make sure you've captured um what's happening in the morning so even if you are only having a little bit of dinner and you want to go and get your head down because you're tired or not feeling great, you know, please do see Steve and get, get that briefing from him so that you can head off to, uh, to get some kip, knowing what, what the plan is for tomorrow if it changes. Um, as Helen said, I mean, we, you know, some of you have been waiting a long time for this. Maybe all of you have been signed up since the beginning, you know, 2019. Um, into 2020. It's taken a long time to get through the pandemic. Thankfully, we are all out the other side and, you know, you're still keen to go. So, you know, live every moment of this because it does go by. If you've done the trips before, you, you know, you get really excited about them and you get to the airport and the next thing you know, you're on the airport, you're with your flying home again. So, you know, make every moment count if there's options to go and see something or do something i'd really encourage people to you know to, to take every opportunity they, there is to to do whatever they can um steve and palmer will meet you at uh, heathrow um three hours before your flight departure so the time's there um 9 40 the flight is so they'll meet you about half six um in heathrow on saturday the 22nd and you will fly out um to Kathmandu together um, arriving to Kathmandu um, on towards the end of the second day, um, and there will just you know there'll be time to come out of the airport, meet the local guy, jump on a bus, and transfer to a hotel that's in central Tamil um, in Kathmandu. It's probably about half an hour, forty minutes, something like that. So by the time we get to the hotel, um, we might have a bit of late dinner, and then a, a quick briefing just to uh, put you in the picture, and then you know get to bed and have um, as much rest as possible before the start of the trek. So on day three, we've got a morning flight to Pokhara. Now, part of that briefing on day two, one of the questions that did get raised was about um, how you split your kit up into various things. I'm aware some people are staying on after and doing um, the extension, or maybe there's some people just extending and doing their own thing. Um, there will be an opportunity to leave some kit um, in a bag, which you'd need to provide. Um, if you don't have them, you could uh, well, you probably haven't got time actually with arrival times. There's obviously loads of kit um, stores in um, Kathmandu itself that sell very cheap outdoor kits, but you probably haven't got time to go and buy a bag. So some sort of bag, um, just a, a loose, you know, a very flimsy or dry bag or something like that. Preferably if you could put a lock on it, a bit of extra security, that would be great. Um, and you will be able to leave that at the hotel in Kathmandu. And those are all clothes that, you know, like your travel clothes or clothes you've bought or things you've bought, books or whatever for, you know after the trek that you don't need whilst you're trekking you'll be able to leave that in um in Kathmandu itself then not when we fly to Kathmandu or when we fly to Pokhara on day three you kind of split your, the rest of your kit into to three parts one is your day bag which has everything you need to go trekking in apart from trekking poles because they do need to go into the whole luggage of um of that flight but you are able to retrieve them at the other end before we head off to um, go 
trekking. So you'll have your day bag, which is essentially packed with all the stuff that you will carry with you each day, waterproofs, thermal layers, sun hats, sun cream, glasses, camera, sweets, snacks, water bottles, etc. cetera. Um, you take that on as your carry on bag. You will also have then um, a sort of trail bag, which will be the things that you want or that you need to have with you whilst you're out trekking. So that your sleeping bag, um, wash kit, spare clothes, etc. Um, and then there is an opportunity to have another small bag that's that's within that um, hold luggage that you can take out um, that has a nice set of clothes for the celebration meal because that will happen in Pokhara when we get back from the trek and that will get taken by the local team in Pokhara and stored safely. So you sort of leave Kathmandu on the morning of day three with a hold luggage that might have your trekking poles in if you have them, plus a small separate bag that you will be able to decant when you get to Pokhara and you'll carry your day bag on as hand luggage. Steve will explain it all. I just wanted to sort of set that up. Will we need, will we need a lock for that one? No. That, that, that just needs to be in, in a dry bag or something. It all gets securely stored um, um, in the stores of our, the, the, the team have a, a local uh, place within Pokhara. So that is fine. Um, the hotel is totally secure, but well, in Kathmandu, we've sort of left that element to the hotel to provide that you know service. We've never had a problem before. It's just, you know, it's a sort of um, sensible precaution to have, I suppose, as extra. But the one in in, in Pokhara is not necessary because it's, it's all safely secured by our own team. So there's no problem there. Um, again, to Pokhara, like I said, there's a, quite a bit of um, faffing around. A, the internal, the domestic terminal, um, in Kathmandu is right next to the international but when you arrive on day two into the international terminal it sort of runs like most um, you know international airports do they you know, quite ordered um, and you go through and there's a conveyor belt and you pick your bags up and you move move out and you know meet in the area when you go into the domestic one it's all a bit more chaotic because they're obviously transferring lots of local produce and things on the flights as well Steve and the local guides are really good at sort of helping you and herding you through and making sure the bags are in the right area at the right time. There's security checks that they do and there's a male line and a female queue. So you sort of get a bit separated on that. Um, and equally, when you get into Pokhara, retrieving those bags, they sort of come out into a big hall that's got all the kit in. Um, so it looks really chaotic, but the locals know what they're doing and everything you know works seamlessly as long as you sort of go with the flow and, and listen to Steve and the local crew. Um, once we've sorted that out, picked out our uh, trekking poles, decanted the little bag we want to leave with our uh, nice clothes for the celebration meal and then we've just got our, the trail bag left with everything that we want on the trail and our rucksack, we jump on a, a bus and transfer out to the start of the walk. So, and it's a really nice, gentle introduction to the, to the trekking. You probably have lunch before you start trekking. So we fly in the morning, do all our transfers, get there, and then have a bit of a lunch and a bit of a breather. And then once we've done that, we set off walking. It's about three hours in the afternoon um, to, to do that trek. Um, and then we, We've got our first full day of trekking, which is about six or seven hours. Think about if you're a smaller group and you know all get on really well, and if you, your feet are doing feet and legs are feeling fine, it could be a little bit less than that, um, or it could take a little bit more. There's absolutely no rush. You can see in the photos, you know, these sorts of you know, these valleys, and you we sort of go down into the valley bottom and then climb back up the other side. So, actually. On this day, you can see, if it's clear, you can see all the way across to Galagion, which is sort of just off to the left of this photo. So we go down to here and then up and across to the left. You can see it and then, you know, but it's going to take you four, five, six hours to get there. Um, 
down into the valley and back up the other side. Beautiful, beautiful uh, landscape. Um, again, with terraces, cultivated land. And Galagion is up at 1,750 metres. So, you know, getting higher up into those hills, it means the temperatures drop down a little. In terms of temperature, that was one question that came up. Generally, during the day, somewhere between 20 and 25, I would have thought at this time of year. Um, at night, 10 to sort of 13, something like that, in the higher camps. So this one, Galagion, Cyclus is at 2,000 metres. It could go down a little bit below that, maybe seven or eight, but something in, in that region. Um, so a reasonable difference between, you know, night and day, but certainly not, um, you know, anything down towards a frost or freezing. Well, that would be very unusual for this time of year. Um, and so, so as we were saying, this this is the still got the, the camping itinerary. So day five, we normally Gallagher on to Tara Top, um, but what we're going to aim to do is to go up to Tara Top and then carry on down and do a part of of the the, the next day. So this is where we're sort of juggling the um, the night stops very slightly. So as I showed you on that map, there's a sort of long, steady ridge line that wanders up um, to take us to Tara Top. So we come along along the valley and then heading up a ridge line that goes up and up and up. And it's one of it's the highest point in that region. And hopefully, weather's really clear and you get some fantastic um, views up into the mountains. Um, Machu Pucara is a fishtail mountain. It's really stunning if you um, if you get some good views of that. And then beyond it, you can see the higher higher summits of the Annapurna. Um, and yeah, we've come down. Like I said, lots of people that all want to come out and say hello. Um, in when you are staying in the homestays, probably a good opportunity to talk about the homestays. So they are they're like you know quite simple guest houses. Um, they have a communal room that you will sort of socialise and eat in, and it has, um, if it's needed, they, they have a, a wood burner stove that they have for the winter um, it's in the, in the centre of the room, and that sort of provide, is the only source of heat um, for, the, for the building. And that's so you spend, you know, your evenings um, and sort of downtime in that room if it's cold and, and needing to be heated. And then there are, are, are rooms for people to, to sleep in. They're fairly simple, it, fairly simple washing facilities, but there is water available um, and toilets, obviously, each night um, rather than on, on the camping one. I mean, we have we provided you know bowls of water on the camping itinerary and also some water toilets where there weren't ones in the village available but with the homestay there's obviously they've got a bit more infrastructure in place so there are facilities to to wash it is worth taking um you know it's like a small trek towel it's on the kit list uh, it's worth definitely worth having one of them because there will be opportunities to uh, wash um, and possibly um, in cyclers, actually, they might be able to uh, find a, a place to to have a shower. Um, but the yeah, trekking um, towel is, re is really useful to, to be able to uh, to give yourself a wash. Wouldn't rely on being able to have yeah showers and full body washes every day. So um, wet wipes to you know rub rub and wash and clean as much as you can the essential bits um, is a good idea as well um, so yeah this day is slightly changed as I say we've come down into Cicles already um, and and we will have done Parje on the way to Cicles um, so you'll see that and so on this day is the opportunity actually to head um, it's just off this shot actually off to the right um, you can head up and uh, and explore another part of the region and then come back down for a second night in Cyclas. Um, so again, it's probably it's four to five hours that day. So if we've taken 
and probably an extra two to come off from Tara top down to Sickless and we're doing four or five hours. You're probably timing wise about the same number of hours. Kilometer wise, it's going to be slightly more um, doing doing it this way, but um, all very doable. And I think you know the benefit of being able to do that, those homestays and, and immerse yourself in the culture is is really special and you know it's, it's it's quite rare that we get the opportunity to do it because the groups are, are often bigger and the, you know there's sort of there's not the infrastructure there to take big groups in this environment um and so then day seven instead of from parje we'll go from cyclers to tanting again very similar it might add um about half an hour potentially to the to the timing um because it's a little bit higher, so you're dropping down a little bit further. But it's quite a tough descent all the way down to the valley. It can be steep in sections, um, come down through some forests, and you drop in over, it says almost 700 metres here, but actually it'll be over 700 metres from um, cyclers. So if you've got walking poles, this is the day to really utilise them, really help take the... You know the weight out of your knees and knees all of that if you've had any niggles with your knees then taking painkillers before you start the day some ibuprofen very much um, advised just to um, help with that and taking breaks throughout as we as we descend um, it's, it's a long way to be you know trying on the brakes all the time so that can feel a bit longer a bit further than it actually is um, just for the effort and then we get down into the valley bottom and then the, the ascent on the other side is, is not too bad it's um, it, you sort of traverse slowly upwards so you're going across the slope and up rather than straight up it um, into Tanting which is a lovely little uh, village on the other side of the river valley um, and again nice clear times you get to look back across the terrain that you've you've done over the last two or three days which is really nice so yeah there you go so yeah. often you know clouds come and uh, cover the very tops of the uh, the high mountains but again you know, some really stunning views that you will have um, this is a shot actually this photo is taken at Tara top so this group here did the same as you. They uh, had lunch at Tara Top and then moved off down. So again, you're looking up towards the Annapurnas there and absolutely gorgeous photos. Uh, hopefully gorgeous views. Um, the last day then from Tanting to Pokhara, again, having ascended back up, uh, you, it's quite a steep down, but it's not as long as the previous day. Um, come down gradually then down through the valley and again you're sort of descending across the slope as you as you go lower and lower and then you reach the end of the trail where you, you sort of cross the cross the river and come out to the end of the trail and the bus will be waiting for us to jump on and transfer down to Pokhara and into a hotel and you'll be definitely be able to have a nice clean shower um, and when you're on the trail, if you've done trips, it sounds like quite a few of you have done trips before, so you, you know you all slowly get a bit grubbier together throughout the duration of the trip, but you don't notice it because you're all doing it. Um, it's not until you walk into a lovely, pristine hotel reception that everyone else has, you know, been uh, just wandering around Pokhara, having showers every day, that you realise that you do probably to do with a shower. And it's great to have those facilities to go and to then really, you know, really start to celebrate um, and have a fantastic meal in Pokhara. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful town. And then yeah, a cold beer or a glass of wine if you want one. Um, and you know, really have an opportunity to reflect on what you've achieved in terms of the challenge and also the money raised and really sort of bring it all home um, as, to, as to why we're out there. Um, and then on day nine, start, you know, this is our sort of time to relax a little bit more. Um, we've completed the main challenge. Um, so we'll have a, a little scenic flight back from Pokhara to Kathmandu. Um, and, get, and then there's time to have an explore around Kathmandu. And there's 
endless things that you can go and see. There's Durba Square, there's Boudinath, Swari Boudinath. Um, so there's a big gomper that you could go and have a look at um, or go down to the uh, to the river, to the Hindu temples. It, it's absolutely stunning. If you've been before, you know what I'm talking about. If you haven't had the opportunity to go to Kathmandu, it's it's an absolutely yeah, it's fantastic. It's vibrant. It's active. It it feels really cool to walk around. It doesn't feel too intimidating, um, even if you're new to traveling or that kind of environment. It's still um, it's a very welcoming place. The locals are really really friendly. So there's an opportunity to spend a bit of time in Kathmandu. And as Helen said, I can't remember, Manu, Mana? Who's your local contact there, Helen? Manny. Manny, sorry, yeah. Um, it, day nine is actually a Sunday, so it wouldn't ordinarily be working, but he, they are looking to, uh, to make themselves available on that day to, to come and see you in, in Kathmandu when we get back. Um, and again, obviously, as you've got a, the, the last night in Nepal so you'd be able to head out and have dinner and if Manny um, has got some recommendations and it works out that uh, can go out and share in a dinner together while still explaining everything that's going on then fantastic um, if not then you know, obviously Steve will be able to recommend some places to go or you can just head off and explore for yourself it's a, it's a really nice relaxing day with, with an afternoon and evening in Kathmandu to, to soak up as much of the sort of Nepalese culture and vibrancy of it and the warmth because, you know, it's nice and warm there. And it, by the time you go from here, I mean, it's already started getting cold in the UK. So, um, you know, come the 22nd of October when you head out, it will be properly cold so yeah make the most of the warmth lots of early christmas present buying fantastic shopping opportunities silk scarves and hats and gloves and like i said if you like outdoor kit there's loads of shops that uh, that make um you know very reasonably priced outdoor kits some of it's good some of it's not so good if you can you know wheedle out um, if you're interested and you can sort of go and have a little hunt around, it's a really cool place, a cool city to, to finish the trip in. And then on day 10, it's uh, an early, well, early-ish um, trip to, to the airport to come home. So I don't know, I can't remember if the flight details were sent out previously, but the, the, the schedule changed very slightly. The, the, it leaves half an hour later out of Kathmandu. It still arrives into Doha in the same time. So I'm not quite sure how they've miraculously lost half an hour of the flight time. But so the, the departure now is 10.15 and need to be there at least two hours beforehand. So you're probably looking at, um, and it takes a while to get out there and sort yourselves out, probably looking to leave the hotel between 7 and 7.30, something like that, to get to Kathmandu and then fly home. If you're coming home, obviously, um, for those of you who are not coming home, I think there's, I think there's three of you um, who are going off to do the Chitwan um, National Park extension, which is just fantastic. And if you right back, um, take you right back to the picture of Nepal or the, the map of Nepal and Kathmandu there sort of stuck near in the middle, directly south of Kathmandu towards the Indian border is where Chitwan National Park is. Um, and you'll have, the people who are staying on, um, you've got the, the details of that. And yeah, hopefully you get to see one of these beautiful animals um, or a few of them out in the wild. And there's lots of other wildlife to, to do as well. And it's a, it's a fantastic thing. And yeah, I hope you have a, a great time on that. If you're doing that, that starts um, on the morning of day 10 when the group are coming home, you will set off and do this. Um, and then there will be information all about that and they'll take you and your itinerary finished with a similar flight time, which you all have separately um, a few days later. Uh, I just put this slide in just to remind me if I haven't looked, but if there are some medical and insurance forms that we haven't had, please do send them to us. Um, the thing about the insurance is, well, you've got to have travel insurance. Uh, we just need the policy number and the 24-hour um, medical emergency number, just so we've got it on our records. 
um, and for any reason you're not able to call your insurance company yourself, then we've got the details and we can phone on your behalf. If you haven't done your medical questionnaire, then yeah, we need to see that as quickly as possible so that it can be sort of passed. I'm sure you have, because we're well within the, the time of need and all of this. Um, everyone's got their passports. There's been a few panics over the last few months on of not on your trip particularly, but on other trips of you know people suddenly looking at their passport, dusting it off for the first time in two year two years, and realizing it's run out or it doesn't have enough validity. Just a, a double or triple check on that. Um, visas and um, you can do on arrival if you haven't already done it. Very straightforward. It's there's a sort of link, I suppose, with. Um, in terms of COVID requirements, if you are fully vaccinated, then you just need evidence of your COVID pass and you can just get a, a visa on arrival very, very straightforward. If you are not vaccinated, um, you, well, I'd advise you to go and check the current advice just to double check it hasn't changed. Things are changing all the time. But I think currently you would need to have a negative PCR test just in case there is anyone in the group who is not fully vaccinated and then you would be able to you know get your visa um money nepalese rupee uh, us dollars and sterling are widely used and easy to change there's holes in the wall that um in Kathmandu that you'd be able to take money out of if you didn't want to get it before and have got um these sort of travel cards international cards like a monzo uh, type card we recommend, I say, I mean, there's very, quite an arbitrary figure of between two and 300 quid um, in terms of spending money. Obviously, um, there are things that you need to do. Um, there's a couple of meals not included, basically in free time. So you'd need some money to cover them, but that doesn't take two or 300 quid. We strongly recommend um, collecting a tip for the local crew who you will, if you haven't experienced local crew and how hard they work, you will, by the end of your trip, be very happy to contribute to that, hopefully. Uh, about $50 is a sort of recommended, maybe a little bit more because of a slightly smaller group and uh, wanting to make sure that they, you know, um, do that. But again, you know, so 60, let's say $60 for the tip and, you know, 30 or $40 for a couple of meals, there's your bare minimum. Um, and then the rest is, is as much as you want on top of that to, um, to buy things. But yeah, it's very easy to get money out of holes in the wall. It's very easy to change money. So if you had sterling cash, um, then you can take that and certainly change it in Kathmandu. Not as easy to do in Pokhara, but it is possible. US dollars you can use to, to spend um, as well as exchanging if you had so um, and obviously yeah, credit cards of descriptions in the bigger shops and hotels that take credit cards uh, Steve will have your flight tickets and we'll meet you at the airport with them I mean they're e-tickets so you will actually just be able to hand over your passport and check in but what we'd advise is to actually meet up with Steve first so that he knows everybody's there and can do a bit of a chat with the group before proceeding through to check in. Um, we have talked a bit about this, but real essential kits, obviously during the day, 20 to 25 degrees, shorts and t-shirt, if you like that sort of thing, or trekking trousers, nice and lightweight. Um, you'll obviously be walking and having to, you know, a good level of activity. So whilst you're walking, you'll be warm. If it's overcast and a bit windy, the higher you go, the colder it gets. So having some sort of layering system to keep yourself warm, if that's a long sleeve thermal and a thin fleece and your waterproof jacket, you know, on top of your trekking t-shirt, that's nice four layers should keep you certainly warm enough for any of during the day and trekking. Little first aid kit, again, painkillers um, and plasters, things to fix blisters most of the day, time. Your day sack, um, which is what you will have, 20 to 25 litres, something like that, um, if you haven't already bought it. Trekking poles, if you like them, you probably haven't got time to get used to them. I mean, you could, um, if you haven't got them and thinking after my little talk that actually you should think about having some. Um, and you've got a pair and you want to take them with you, I would, if you're not used to them, 
do as much as you can between now and then to get used to them there is a knack to walking with them once you've got it it's totally natural and your right pole goes when your left foot is there and you sort of alternate it really helps take pressure off the knees walking boots need to be worn in so again if you haven't done much in them and they're quite new you know keep keep going with them even if they're the fabric ones that feel really comfortable straight away doing five days of five or six days of continuous trekking in them um, is totally different to wearing them for a couple of hours uh, around the park. Waterproof is essential and a kit bag to take you on the trail. Um, sleeping bag um, need, and like I said, gets down to, well, let's call it seven or eight. So, uh, you know, two, three season sleeping bag. If you really feel the cold, then possibly a four season sleeping bag. Um, you don't need to take a roll mat, um, but you, you know, dry bags are good to, or you know, or even bin bags or rubble sacks, anything that can put your kit into, um, you know, separate them out so that they're in different piles, but also to keep them dry if they're, you know, as they're being transported from one camp to another and there's a heavy downpour when the bags are being unloaded, you know, the crew look after them as much as possible, keep, keep them dry, but you know, having extra protection inside, especially for things like your sleeping bag, um, have a bag all of its own. Hats and gloves, again, for the evenings, um, thermals, as I said, head torch, really important. Um, even in the home states, they don't, you know, don't all have um, electricity or reliable, um, lighting so even if you're in indoors still important to have a, a head torch and steve will tell you this but you know when you get into to the accommodation and you're sorting your kit out before dinner try and make the habit of putting that into your pocket so that you've got it so that you haven't spent all night in the nice communal area chatting and having dinner and then come to try and you know find your bed and not have any lights to do it with um snack bars and sweets um, and any little nibbles if you've been training and have found some um, some type of energy bar or sweets that you really like take some of them as extra snacks throughout the day uh, we provide obviously all the, the breakfast and lunch and dinner but these are just additional things to top up your energy throughout some travel um, a little wash kit or something um, and again, it's not on here, but, you know, Trek Town. That is not an exhaustive list. That was just a couple of slides that I picked out some of the, the really important ones. And again, hopefully it's going to be nice and sunny. Um, and it is important to have some sort of sun protection with sunglasses, sunscreen, hat, something that covers the back of your neck. Um, and also, you know, hydration is, is absolutely critical. You want to be able, to, you need to be able to carry two litres of water, at least two litres of water on you at any one time. It, whether you use one of these sort of platypus or camelback type bladder systems that have a little tube, some people love them, they stick them over their shoulder and they just sit there on your sort of rucksack strap and you can sip away. Fantastic for being able to drink that then often. Other people don't like them and just have water bottles, whichever suits you best, as long as you're conscious that you need to drink little and often. Um, on trekking days, you should be looking to drink somewhere between mm, probably two to four litres of water, depending on the, the temperature and the, what's happening. Um, you should drink two litres just doing your normal life in the UK. That's the sort of, you know, recommendation for a sort of healthy, hydrated person, two litres. So, you know, adding six to eight hours of trekking into that up and down strenuous slopes in Himalayas and up to 2,800 metres, your body's going to be working that much harder. So, yeah, having plenty of fluid, little and often, however you take it, worth also... Um, Maybe take if you have some little um, hydration tablets or sach sachets um, that you can add again, probably towards the end of the days to uh, just to help replenish salts um, and energy levels. It's not essential. Some people don't like them. It's also the thing is not to try anything new. That would be one of my big pieces of advice. Don't take a new bit of kit and try out for the first time because you know you'll have trouble with it and 
get to know your kit before you go. Equally with snack bars and sweets and energy things, you know, make sure you've tried them in the UK before you go so that you know that they suit your body. Your body will be, you know, getting used to the different climate, the different food, the different uh, temperature and culture and everything like that. It was working quite hard anyway to stay nice and stable by then adding on top of that, you know, new energy gels and or track but the snack bars, um, you know, can have a detrimental effect. And so the benefit you get from those energy is wasted because it's, it's made you, you know, have a bit of an upset tummy. So, you know, something to be aware of. So don't take it, you know, anything, try it new for the first time. Okay, and that was everything I wanted to cover. I hope that's filled in some gaps that you might have had. I just let me just check that the, the questions that came up. Um, I have answered yes, the ones that got sent through hopefully have been answered. If anyone has any questions, please you know unmute yourselves and and ask away. Are there any in the chat? Um, that, no, none in the chat at the moment. I've, I've no. got one. Uh, I think, yeah, a couple of people but do. Passports. Do, do we hold our own passports the whole trip? Or, I mean, you know, we're adults, but I'm just, is, is that is that what happens? Yeah, so you need you need to take your passports with you. Um, and they can be left in the the bag that stays in in the um, in the operator's sure. thing in Pokhara. Yeah. You don't have to take it on the trail itself. Okay. 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 Uh, Rob, I've got a question. Yeah, fire away. Um, just want to ask about the support team. Um, yes. Do they do they transport our um, our large kit bags or trail bags in a sort of pickup? And you know, is that how all the transportation is done? Because they no, they're not carrying us on route on the trek, are they? They. There's no vehicle access to, to to some of those places, and so it is done either on, um, you know, with animals and or you know, uh, sherpas, human human sherpa porters. Okay, I mean, so they they carry your yeah your trail bags, which you know shouldn't they won't end up weighing that much because they by the time you're carrying the stuff that you you know need on you during the day and you've left some stuff in Kathmandu and you've left maybe you know some clothes in Pokhara the only things that will end up being in your trail bag are a, a wash kit a sleeping bag some maybe some you know charge we haven't talked about charging that's another thing um you know some things to to charge up your equipment with and some you know some spare clothes it's probably somewhere between sort of six and seven kilos each um and they are you know it's a, it's a great source of employment for for them and you know they they're very used to doing it it's equally it's managed well that they don't get overloaded and you know have to carry everyone's stuff with just one or two people but then i mean there's food and there's uh, cooking utensils and all yeah that. yeah yeah there's i mean you, there'll be a quite a team that's supporting you yeah so they, I mean, they have to use animals really some of the time. They do on some of the some of it, and others it's, it's done by porters. Really? Yeah. yeah. I mean, they are phenomenal. You know, we will be as you I say we when you're walking and you know finding going up to the you know bit of altitude, you know, mm -hmm. tough. They will skip past us with you know fifty kilo loads on their back in flip-flops that are made of old car tires <laughs> having a whale of a time singing chatting laughing you know it, it's all in a day's work for them um and yeah it's I mean, just it's, having the animal i'm worried about i'm just i hope yeah. not so if they're if when you're on the trail and there are animals passing i mean they use um something that it's, it's too you're too low to get into yak territory they, they own yaks need to be much higher it's got to be much colder they only really you know um come in the sort of everest region and the higher regions of it so you have they have animals called uh jock pays which are almost a bit of a cross between a yak and a, and a cow or a buffalo type 
um, uh, beasts. If you are walking on a trail and you hear, they nearly all have bells on them so you can hear them coming. It's really important, and Steve will reiterate this, but that you, what they call is stepping to the mountain side. So if you're walking on a path where there's a, you know, there's a drop on the right hand side or the slope is on your right hand side going down to the valley and it's ascending up on your left so you could almost sort of put your hand on the the side of the mountain and you know down to your right as thing it's really important that you all step towards the mountain and let the animals pass on the outside them and their you know um owners and the porters are all very used to skipping around in the mountains um so they're very, you know they're very happy to take the outside line and we just move over you will get into a rhythm of warning each other, communicating front to back, back to front, um, wherever the animals, there's not loads and loads of them around, but you will undoubtedly come across them. And it's really important that yeah, you step to the mountain side to let them pass. Um, no, the for me, it's more, more than the animal. I love animal. It's just animal carry my bag that I'm not very happy with. So I really you can hope carry it. <laughs> I'm, I'm, uh, to be honest, I'm much rather if if it has to be me of a donkey. I'm much rather carrying my own bag. Yeah, they're used. Oh, yeah. yeah, they are. If if animals are used, they are very well looked after. The company we, our local partner in Nepal, we have used for. I mean, well, longer than I have been here. I've been here twenty years, and we've been using them long before them. They have. An amazing reputation for a looking after their staff and all of their kit and their clients really really well. It's there is no horror stories of malnourished you know animals overloaded stumbling around. You know it is almost much more the other way that we you know we underload them and you know not overfeed them, but you know they're very well looked after. Thank you. Okay. I, my questions are really around the homestay because that's kind of the, the new thing mm. that's kind of come up on this. Um, so in terms of what that actually means um, and also coming back to animals because I'm allergic to pretty much anything with hair. So um, if they have sort of, I mean, are they the sort of places that would have pets or anything that I'd need so would I need to start worrying about bringing my antihistamines and stuff like that with me I mean I would definitely take antihistamines with you um if you've got you know allergies and and known they you know there are communities that have um that do have animals I wouldn't you know they probably wouldn't you know domestic animals uh, they wouldn't call them pets but um, yeah yeah but yeah more so working animals but they work working they animals to be but, things around yeah yes yeah absolutely um okay. so i would um, yeah, would take antihistamine we obviously have some in the med kit we have um epi pens as well if you you know if you ever if you have epi pens that you would carry with you I, as a, no I, I don't have that severe that allergies but no, okay. um, yeah it, it's more it affects my, it, it, it tends to mean I get asthmatic, which is obviously not great. No. Um, so, but that's fine. So long as I, I know in advance, I'd probably be taking antihistamines out with me anyway. I just wanted to understand. The other thing, um, and I hadn't updated my details because I'm not quite sure what what my what, what's appropriate. So I think in my original sort of details, I'd said I was vegetarian. I'm now kind of pretty much a default vegan. Is that likely to be a problem? Uh, no, I wouldn't have thought so. Um, me, I mean, it certainly won't be a problem because we've got, you know, a couple of weeks or so to warn them. Uh, I can't yeah. see on the screen. Who's, who's, who is it's this? It's Jill Griffiths. Jill, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think for me, I mean, I'm, I'm vegan partly because it's really easy to be vegan here. Um, and if, if yes, I'm going yeah. somewhere where it's not easy to be vegan, I'm willing to make compromises. But um, by default, I would much prefer to be vegan. Yeah. And to be fair, I mean, they don't um, they don't have lots of dairy and meat. Um, yeah. 
to be to be honest. Um, you know, their their sort of national dish is dal bat, which is you know lentils and rice, um, and yeah, I mean they would chicken is quite readily available um, now, but traditionally, it's dairy is really not that common. Yeah, and if so, we're getting chai and things like that, what would that be made with? Um, because that's sort of turned up on a couple of the slides and yeah I would need to check actually I mean the thing is if we say we've got somebody who's vegan they will you know they will cater for it like I said they've been you know been running okay, that, groups, that's but, fine I, I it's I, I could I could I, you, you know, can then I, flex from that point if yeah. you choose to yeah that's good thank you um, um oh sorry and for the overnight for the so we'd, every night we're going to be doing some kind of accommodation every night. We're not going to be under canvas or equivalent at all yeah. on this, Neil. That that is the plan. Yeah, unless everybody says that's outrageous and we you know we're desperate to camp. We see it as a as an opportunity to do something you know special and a bit different um, and to increase the experience. If everybody jumped up and said. Oh, we think it's taken away. Personally, I was looking forward to the camping aspect, being outdoors, to, to be honest, but I'll go with the flow. But that was something I was sort of looking forward to. But, you know. Somehow the same, but maybe, I don't know, obviously I go with the majority. At least it would have been nice to do a couple yeah, of nights outdoors. A couple of nights. Just, yeah. 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 But the, appreciate the experience with the locals yeah. is also amazing. Yeah, the, the difficulty with blending it is, is, is uh, you know, having, gearing up the whole team to come with loads of yeah. camping equipment and extra, because then it's, you know, they're taking lots of tables and chairs and portaloos and yeah. you know, there's a whole a infrastructure, yes, in, you know, to do for, for one or two nights, which is the, I, I think I, you, I missed the beginning then, be so are we, are we doing the overnight stuff because it's a reduced number of people so therefore we're, we're not taking we, that equipment is that what the decision i might have missed it sorry yeah so that's it that's the opportunity is to um to to simplify things a little but equally it was because we weren't having because it's a small group we, we're able to do it um and not having the separate day to go and do a water you know water aid project visit which is traditional on on the water aid trips we're, we're trying to you know up the cultural side of it i don't think you will you know whilst they're they're very simple homestays so i think you won't really you know notice the much of a difference between being under canvas and being in one of the homestays to be honest it's not like going into an insulated house and feeling totally you know away from the elements so we would be using our sleeping bag and are we like sharing a big room with everyone or yeah, is it so everyone in different location or? No, so it will be in, in one location. It won't be all in one room. It will be in um, probably split over three or four rooms. Um, it depends each night. It changes a little bit, but uh, it's, you know, it's, it's in the way that's similar to the camping. It feels like communal living because you will have one central space like it would have been around you know um a table and chairs out once you were camping and do all your t tents will be in one sort of little area and you will probably be able to hear well you, if anyone snores you will hear the snoring through the canvas you will hear the snoring through the you know because the the a lot of the homestays the walls between rooms are, are nothing much more than plywood um so you you still have that sort of communal feel it's not like going to a hotel and closing your room and then it's just you and your roommate totally isolated okay do they, do, do they actually have beds in there at all or we were just they using... do yeah okay. no no they have beds yeah so do we use our sleeping bags then so if you've got i, I always take my sleeping mat with me um if, when i'm doing homestays um, and then because then the thickness of the mattresses does vary depending on the homestays and the regions that you're traveling. Some of them are, are fantastic and are just like proper mattresses and there's no need for it. I always do take my mine's a little, you know, um, self inflating thing. So it packs down quite small and doesn't weigh a lot. Um, so I do tend to take mine as a, as a backup. 
Oh, but sorry, Rob, I meant, I meant, do we sleep in our sleeping bags? Oh, our sleeping bed? bags, yes, 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 yes. We do, right. Sorry, I thought you said sleeping mats. And no, you definitely, yeah, you need sleeping bags, yes. Um, and what about additional cultural considerations? Because we'll be in a homestay rather than just in a, in a camping group. Yeah, no, it would, in terms of what you need to do, um, I think the, I mean, no difference really. I mean, the temperature is not going to be um, such that you would walk around in. I'm not know, going to be in a strappy top at ten o'clock. Strappy top minutes. and it's short not be shorts. Is it? You know, <laughs> yeah. You know, um, I wouldn't do that whether you were camping or staying in a homestay. Um, it, yeah, so it doesn't change that aspect of it. Thank you. And, and um, about, one question uh, for me: um, those internal flights. What are they like? They're absolutely fine. So Pokhara is quite a big airport, so they have bigger planes um, that can fly, you know, into into the runway. All the anything you've seen on the TV or stories of the flights that go up to Everest, for instance, with the, the much smaller planes, and it's a fantastic airport to land in up in Lucknow and the Everest region, but. Um, you know, they are, if, if you're a bit nervous, then it's um, it's a bit of an intimidating flight. The one to Pokhara, they're much bigger. You know, the, the flights are uh, 100, 120 seater plane. So you totally different scale of, of flying, much longer runways. Um, it's only about 45 minutes, not even, maybe half an hour. It doesn't, you're sort of coming down as soon as you've gone up. So you don't have that feel of, oh, we're in a small little plane doing this sort of wobbling all over the place around the mountains feel, okay, which is great you. for those people who are nervous about it. Some people, you know, like that level of excitement in their lives. Thank you. Uh, hi, I've got a couple of questions. The first one is about um, biting insects. Are there, are we going to encounter a lot of those? Um, not many. Um, Good. <laughs> They, there are some in, like Kathmandu and in and around Pokhara, really. Um, when no. you're on the trail itself, you know, there's not that many. Yeah, okay, fine. And the other thing uh, is about water. Um, will we be, is the water, I mean, if we're filling up our bottles or or, or whatever at the at the homestays, is the water, I presume the water's okay to drink or will there be bottled water? No, well, we will uh, boil and treat all the water you have. Um, so, yeah, we will supply um, drinking water for everyone. You know, I, you don't, I wouldn't and use that for everything. So if you're brushing your teeth, you know, don't yeah. take it straight out of the taps unless we know for sure. And, you know, you've had the briefing from Steve to say, yeah, that's absolutely yeah. fine. It's got, it's got some sort of filtration and treatment system built into their yeah. taps. We would use the water that you are given by us. Yeah. OK, thank you. Any others? Uh, sorry to be a pain. Uh, you mentioned, I know you covered this earlier, but I've got connectivity problems today. Um, uh, you mentioned about currency. Uh, um, should we take Nepalese currency with us or would we be exchanging that when we're there? You get it when you get there is the easiest thing to do. Um, so either if you've got an international travel card, then you can just take money out from a hole in the wall in Kathmandu, or you could, they have lots of little, you know, um, exchange places that you could take sterling and or US dollars to change right. into local currency. Sorry, I know you covered that already. Thanks very much. No worries. Um, oh, I've just, just got one other thing. Sorry. Um, will there be any opportunities for swimming? a good question um i suppose i mean swimming is probably you know taking it a stretch if you're super keen then um having dips um in the in the rivers or in the sides of the rivers would as long as it, they're not um in flood or you know really fast flowing <laughs> yeah so okay. a dip rather than a swim I would say but it, it's it, worth it bringing possible. my cosy. <laughs> yeah, if you if yeah. you're keen on that sort of thing, then yes. Uh, it's well, something you, I've uh, discovered during the pandemic as well. So uh, yeah, yeah. It, it's been it's been sure. a thing for women of a certain age. It's been... <laughs> yeah, although <laughs> and a few men of a certain a, age as well. 
either a swimming costume or as my as my wife who's scottish calls them glasgow bikinis you can go in which is basically you know just your yeah. uh your trekking undies but um <laughs> yeah um for those of us who stay on the jungle extension um yes. is it would it be steve to to lead that one too or we have another leader no so you'll have um there'll be a guy uh, um, local um, guides will take you. Steve is coming back with the main group. Okay. Uh, what's what's the accommodation on the extension? Is it so? I guess it's just you, me, and um, Paul. It, Paul on that. Yes, yeah. it's a hotel. You stay, or oh, it's sort of like a lodge, lodgy hotel type thing. And it's very jungly in the weather, right? So a completely different, humid and jungly. Yes, humid and jungly, and bitey things, and um, yeah you would need to yeah have um insect repellent and have you know long sleeved but still you know quite light fitting um you know linen shirts trouser etc to to remain nice and cool whilst being covered up they're not always terrible but they can be Lost it wasn't possible to to have any time on the project um it could it just in terms of the the itinerary you'd have had to add, add an extra day to the itinerary to to facilitate it um and well as helen's you know said over the last couple of years or since we've been able to travel again the 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 cost of adding an extra day um just you know became a bit prohibitive for for you know charities who are being super conscious of of money okay all right thank you i'm a bit sad because actually just... that was a really fun day i i really enjoyed that day in in tanzania um so mm. i'm a bit gutted but actually the the idea of the homestays kind of does balance that out for me a little bit so i appreciate yeah. you know we're just trying to do the best that we can do yeah, and we, we've really tried with our Nepal team to make it work in terms of doing a project visit. It's just they're really slammed at the moment, I think partly because um, they've had that big pause in project delivery. So it's just becoming a bit more tricky to facilitate those kind of visits. True. We are doing absolutely what we can to immerse you in that um, project in all the ways that we can with Manny. Um, so we we don't know exactly how that will look yet, but we'll um, we'll update you, um, and hopefully you will get a chance to meet him at some point as well. Right. It was very it was very grounding. It was very kind of you you sort of do the trekking and you sort of have a few lows, you have a few highs, you have everything in between, and then at the end when we saw the reason why we were doing like the the actual seeing it with your own eyes, I found that really interesting. And it was a real sort of experience. Stronger so, message. Yeah, yeah, it kind yeah. of made it all it sort of forced it all home. Mm. Yeah, they are fantastic yeah. days, and we will do everything we can to uh, to you know fill fill some of that gap sure. throughout the trip. Great, thank you. Good to see you again, Javaria. Yeah, you too. Hi, everyone. Sorry. So yeah, if there aren't any questions, that's fantastic. If you think of any between now and the trip, feel free to uh, ping them through on an email and uh, Helen or Lizzie can forward them to us um, or call the office direct if you if you need something. But yeah, hopefully that you know you've got what is it, four four weeks? Three yes. and a half weeks? Three and a half weeks, yeah. Three and a half weeks and you'll be there. Um so if said if you've got new bits of kit or you're still trying out your favorite jelly baby sweet tracker <laughs> bar combination then then lots of practice i've given I, I you the gonna... permission to eat as much as you like <laughs> over the next quick question. Few just 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 a really quick thing because i'm kind of assuming that as i haven't been chased for anything i filled in all the forms two and a half years ago and you've still got, got them on uh, you on must record. have done <laughs> yeah we would have chased if we hadn't got the things um right. i suppose if there's things that have changed for you that would need yeah. updating that would be the thing 
I say the the only thing is my diet, and that wasn't critical, so I hadn't sort of pushed yeah. on it. But no, that's um, fine. I will change that for you. That'd be um, great. Thank you. And so that's there, and we yeah, make, definitely make them aware. Thank you. But, but yes, thank you very much for giving up your time. Thank uh, you. No, thank you for your thank time. You. It's, we've overrun uh, as usual, but thank you. Uh, sorry, Rob. Right. Can I just ask one quick question of Helen? Helen, yes. I just wanted, will we be getting one or two more emails sort of prior to the trip or the start of the yes. trip? Yes, you will be definitely. Yeah. yeah, I just sort of you'll be staying in touch in the next two or three weeks. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. You'll be hearing from Lizzie uh, um, and okay. myself through Lizzie. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, yes, and um, we will do some kind of intro so that you all know who's going to be on the trek as well um, before you go, because it's only about half the group here tonight. Yeah. Um, we'll share the recording with you tomorrow as well, um, so everyone will have seen this webinar too. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much, everyone. Good yeah, evening. Brilliant. Thank have you. a great time. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Bye. See you soon. Bye. Thanks, Rob. No worries. All good. Um, stop recording.